well, look at, look at us, I know. <laughs> <laughs> look at us, whoever thought we'd end up where we are right now. Well, hello there, and welcome to Bible Geeks Weekly Podcast. This is episode 90. I'm Brian Sheely. I'm Ryan Joy. And thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. We are almost done with the end of the book Bible reading here, week 51. It's amazing that we've made it this far into Revelation 13 through 17 this week. What are we going to be talking about now that we're almost finished with this giant reading plan we've been doing? Well, I was thinking about something my wife and I love to do is after we say we go to a gathering or we do a project together or maybe like after Christmas, having juggled all the million things you juggle for Christmas, (laughs) we'll say, okay, how did that go? (laughs) And, And we do what we call debriefing, you know, like you'll do in a business meeting sometimes after a big project. Okay, let's debrief that after action report kind of thing. Yep. And we figure out what do we need to learn from it? What do we do well? What do we do poorly? And so I think that's kind of what we want to do in the last part of this is say, hey, what do we need to take from this year? What can we take from this year? And in a way, it's in this perfectly strange year, Revelation is a perfectly strange book for it to kind of set the stage. I think it's an unusual kind of reading for us. And it's kind of about this big storyline that the Lord is giving us for everything that's happening down throughout history. So yeah, we're, I think we're going to stop and say, what is going on? What kind of day has it been? <laughs> In our job, we call that the hot wash. So I guess we'll be doing <laughs> hot the hot wash. wash of 2020. Yeah, this is the hot wash episode. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So before we get there, though, let's find Jesus, as we always do here in week 51, Revelation 13 through 17. Where is Jesus here in the final book of the Bible? He is the king that no king can conquer. (laughs) He's the king of kings. And so there's at the end of this week's reading in Revelation 17, in verses 7 to 14, there's another strange discussion here about this woman who was a harlot, and she's riding on this beast with seven heads. And so in verse 7, the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and 10 horns that carries her. And then jumping forward a little bit, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. There are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seventh and it goes to destruction. Hopefully you're still with us here. I'm, I'm here. Let's go. <laughs> okay. So they will make war on the lamb, verse 14, and the lamb will conquer them for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. There's a lot there, of course, and we're not going to unpack all of it, though. I think this is a really helpful passage to help us unpack a lot of the storyline in the middle of this book. It's fairly clear here, I think, that this is a picture of Rome. But the idea is that lots of world powers make war on the lamb who died for the whole world, yet he is also king over all kings. And if you if you look at how this is played out just in the context of Rome and of perhaps old Jerusalem, if you, you see that in this, the 70 AD destruction of Jerusalem, but you see all of these powers that rose up in those days. Remember, these were things that must soon take place. Chapter one, verse one. Back in those days, a lot of powers rose up and opposed Jesus, the lamb and his people. And yet Jesus still reigns in the lives of people all over the world. They did not defeat Christ. They did not defeat his kingdom. Nobody's worshiping or serving any of the Roman Caesars today. <laughs> That's not a big movement in the, of all the evil things happening in the world. That's not something that's happening. And of course, other Caesars, so to speak, have risen up and people lift them up, but none will ever conquer the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. And I think that's encouraging and helps us just to remember whatever's going on. The Lord is attentive. The Lord knows 
what's happening in the world and in the ups and downs and political upheaval and the just all the things that happen in society. But ultimately, he will continue and will ultimately conquer. I think that's helpful, especially nowadays with all the political conversations that we've been having in our country. Yeah, it doesn't matter because the king of kings is still on the throne. Pulling that right out of this reading here into today's situation that's going on gives me a lot of comfort to realize that I serve the king that will never be overthrown or defeated or voted out of office by anyone. That's powerful. Yeah, amen. So where did you (laughs) find Jesus here? All right, so Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11, I found Jesus doing something very different something we don't think about very often. He is watching the eternal torment. In Revelation 14, verse 9, John says, And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured with full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur, in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. This isn't typically where we find Jesus, and the reference here to him as the Lamb is something that's been a theme throughout This early to middle section of Revelation referring to Jesus as the lamb who was slain, who was sinless. Where is the lamb here? He is watching the eternal torment of these ones who would not worship God, who worship the beast rather than God. I don't typically think of Jesus watching or seeing what's going on in eternal torment when I picture that, but that's where he is here along with his angels watching these things happen. And like Jesus talked about with Lazarus and the rich man and that view of torment where there's a great gulf between and God is over there and all of those evildoers and people who didn't love God are over on this side and they're so far apart and they're so distanced from each other. But Jesus here is shown to be watching what's going on in this punishment. It's not the kind of presence that I want with Jesus for all eternity. I don't want to be present with Jesus as I'm suffering in torment and he's there watching. And it's, I guess, a contrast to the way that the onlookers oversaw Jesus' death when you go back and think about how he died and all the people hurling insults at him. But he was the savior, the perfect savior, the sinless one. And they're all there watching. And then you get to like Stephen later on in the book of Acts as he's being stoned to death and people like Saul who stood by and they were complicit. But this is the pure and spotless lamb who is watching over God's wrath being poured out on those who wouldn't follow him. He's overseeing this. He's in the presence of this. And just, I don't know, it's a strange picture to think about Jesus there. But God's wrath is something that not only strikes fear into the heart of evildoers, but it it gives a lot of comfort, I think, to people who are on the other side of that, on the receiving end of that, to know that God and the Lamb really are taking care of all of those who have done us wrong and who haven't followed him. Yeah, it's a very it's a very challenging idea. The Lamb who died for all people, behold the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world, now is their judge and stands over the end of all of the evil that has come before it and those evildoers who have practiced these things. And as you've seen, kind of following the storyline of the seals and the trumpets, these trumpets were warnings. They were meant to bring repentance. They weren't utter destruction. They weren't an ending. And then even as we get on further, there is an opportunity to turn. And yet, When there is no turning, as I think maybe we'll continue to talk about, justice, goodness, righteousness matters. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the presence of the Lamb just shows the justice. It doesn't say he's laughing over it. It doesn't say he's happy about it. But it just shows the justice and rightness of this end. So let's get into our second segment here, which is scripture du jour. What is the soup du jour? It's the soup of the day. 
That sounds good. I'll have that. So here we are today in Revelation 16. We were thinking about maybe choosing one of the chapters that had maybe more of a devotional kind of topic. But <laughs> let's just dive right into the middle of this crazy vision that we see here in Revelation 16 and talk about some things that maybe we can pull out of this that are helpful for us. What did you find here in Revelation 16 that that stood out to you? Yeah, well, we're continuing kind of the thought that you started there. These are the seven bowls of wrath that are introduced. And I think that God's wrath can be a hard attribute of God to appreciate and praise. We talked, I think last time, maybe about idolatry here recently, we talked about idolatry that we need to watch out whenever we kind of want to shy away from some attributes of God and not recognize their goodness and their worthiness Mm -hmm. of God in, in all of these things. And a certain kind of wrath is evil. That's, that's something we see throughout the Bible condemned. But that isn't the kind God has. God has a wrath that comes from his love for people and his commitment to justice and goodness. And one of the things I think we need to be careful about is to realize we can't have it both ways. We can't complain about God's patience and complain about his wrath. And you see this kind of in some of the Old Testament prophets like Habakkuk, you know, why aren't you doing something about it? Oh, no, no, don't do anything about it. (laughs) And that kind of, whoa, 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 hold on. (laughs) Oh, easy. Come on. Now you're just going too far. So I think we, we have to pause and just think about what God does as we watch the story of Scripture play out and try to understand the character of God. So in verse one of this chapter, chapter 16, he says, then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So just to think about wrath and how God's wrath comes from his love and his commitment to justice and goodness. One of the things I've appreciated this year is that a lot of people seem to have woken up or woke up, as some people (laughs) might want to say it. They've become woke, I don't know, to the importance of justice. I mean, there's a lot of, maybe there's baggage around that phrase that I just used. A lot of different things that, that people think that means, but a part of this conversation that people are having in the world today has to do with the importance of justice. Mm -hmm. And there is a sense of righteous indignation, which can sometimes veer maybe towards self-righteous indignation. We've got to watch out for that. But it comes from standing for the idea that some things are right and some things are wrong, and that matters. And whatever you think about some of those conversations, I know there's a lot of different things to talk about on it, but it's true. Some things are right and some things are wrong, and that matters. And it should not stand for someone to do evil without someone doing something about it, especially to do evil to another person. And the more you love a person who's treated unjustly, the more angry you become right? Somebody does something to Ashlyn, you're going to be so hot. You, you Somebody's going to have to <laughs> legally restrain you if it's uh, something really bad. Yeah. Like there's just this connection between our love for someone and the amount of anger we have towards the injustice that comes upon them. And that's a big part of the story of Revelation. God's people have suffered at the hands of an evil nation. And we see clear references to the Roman Empire in chapter 17, as we talked about. So as we think about the, say, the Roman Empire and the Jews of old Jerusalem and all the people who are persecuting Jewish believers and Gentile converts and those early Christians, you see why God does not want these evil powers to continue. And he wants to bring this down and he wants to stop it. And he has wrath to pour out. And people have been waiting for that wrath. The martyrs are calling out for that wrath. When are you going to do something about this? When are you going to judge? Why are you letting this stand? And God waits and he tries to bring small judgments to bring repentance. And when that doesn't happen, he brings a greater judgment. And I just wonder if those same people who look around at evil powers in the world and ask, how can God let this stand? How can a God of love let this stand? Are the same people who look at passages like this about God's wrath in the Bible and say, how can a loving God unleash his wrath on evil? 
because we can't have it both ways. And fortunately, God <laughs> always does the most loving and just and right thing. And we don't have to let people like us philosophize and try to figure out what's right. God will do right. But we need to study God and learn from God and appreciate, I think, all of this comes from God who is love. And so wrath comes from that love. Wrath comes from his commitment to justice. Yeah, and I it's hard for me not to think about passages like 1 Peter 2, where Peter is really admonishing his audience there to be subject to every human institution, to the emperors, to the governors, because their job is to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. Their job really is to execute justice, to uphold those who are doing right, and to lay the law down for those who are doing evil. But you can see why God would step in in the case, for example, here of, of Rome, who are punishing, persecuting the church, just putting them through all kinds of trials and tribulations and everything that they're doing to them. You can see why God eventually steps in here and takes them down because they're not fulfilling the role that he set them in place for to uphold justice. And when the church is persecuted, when these early Christians in the first century are being put upon, that's when God's patience finally runs out and he takes steps to correct that situation. And I think even in parenting, you see this with your own kids, like you have patience up to a point. You're waiting for them to make the right decision. You're waiting for them to do the right thing. But at some point, you just have to step in and say, nope, enough is enough. I have to make this right. I have to do something about this. That's not always fun, but that's what God is going to do here. And it makes his people trust him and love him and count on him all the more because he's taking care of them. He's watching over them. And that's always something that we need to see the other side of that coin, that yes, he'll be patient sometimes, but then there are times when he's going to step in. And ultimately, at the end of all time, he'll step in and justice will finally be served, even if it was never served here on earth. Yeah, it's interesting the way we see God's wrath revealed in scripture that, like you said, sometimes he steps in and he gives the appropriate amount of time, you know, like in, in the Old Testament, when the unrighteousness of a particular nation had had a sufficient amount of time fulfilled the unrighteousness of the Amorites or the different period and hundreds of years go by and God is waiting and God is giving them time, the perfect just amount of time. And then he steps in. But then there's also this other way that he reveals his wrath, as Romans 1 talks about, where sometimes he just lets it have its course, lets our evil have its course and collapse in upon itself and bring our own downfall. Because when we won't come back to him, when he's he's doing what he can to bring us back, but when we refuse, there's this spiral, as I often refer to it, this downward spiral that just brings in its own way a fall, a great fall. So, uh, yeah. So where did you find <laughs> in this bowl of wrath passage in chapter 16, where did you find something interesting? Well, I think it kind of ties into what you were just saying. And that is that what goes around comes around. And mm. that maybe spiraling that you were just talking about, I think, is evident here in Revelation 16, verses three through seven. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became like the blood of a corpse. And every living thing died that was in the sea. And the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, Just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. So, again, I think this is another great reminder of God's justice, that his punishment really does fit the crime. What he doles out as punishment is commensurate, really, with what evildoers deserve. And so for those who are persecuting and killing believers, what they get in return is blood to drink. E. That, yeah, that disgusting picture of the plague here, which, by the way, I mean, all of these plagues are totally a throwback to the Egyptian plagues in, in almost right. every way. And we see that here in this water being turned to blood by these two angels pouring out their bowls of wrath. 
But this kind of language here, though, is eye-opening as somebody who's currently opposed to the Lord and to his people. But I think it's also, like we've mentioned a couple times here, I think it's also encouraging to those who are suffering at the hands of those evildoers. And really, that is the audience here. This book is being written to the seven churches who are going through a lot, and they're dealing with a lot of persecution right now. For them to know that God is just, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. I mean, that's something that they can shout when they begin to see the evildoers getting what they deserve, what goes around comes around. I guess the question for me in thinking about this is, what do I deserve? Because I've sinned. I've made mistakes. I've even gone so far as to hurt other people. That's where grace comes into play, though. I think we don't get what we deserve when we call on the name of the Lord, when we trust in him. What we get is mercy. And so what do I deserve? I deserve punishment, but what I get is grace and mercy. And just maybe a, a positive spin on this to think about the other side of it, that if we are opposed to the Lord, we will get what we deserve. It's interesting. It's it's kind of like a, a little bit later on in the chapter, in verse 15, he's going along and there's this discussion of all the things, the bowls of wrath that are being poured out. And it's like the Lord just interjects this parenthetical statement <laughs> in the middle of it as if to say, hey, all you guys who are saying, yeah, that's they're getting what they deserve. They had it coming to them. You watch out for yourself, too. He says in verse 15, in, in parentheses, behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. So in other words, hey, you guys stay awake. Stay awake. You know, you can fall into your own kind of spiral to go with what we're saying. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, the this picture of all of these judgments, I appreciate what you said about the 10 plagues of Egypt. I think that's a really important point because it helps us to understand the dual purpose of these judgments that are coming. Why were those plagues happening? Well, they were to change Pharaoh's mind, but they were also a judgment on him as he hardened more and more and more every time that one of these things that was meant to turn him came and he hardened, that became a judgment on him. So it became both a redeeming force and miracle from God for his people and those who would follow him. And it became also a judgment on those who just kept hardening to it. All right. So let's close this thing out with our third segment. And so we'll debrief a little bit. We'll uh, maybe hot wash the, <laughs> the year 2020. It's been a strange year. And as we consider Revelation in this strange book, Seems to be some correlations between the two that might be helpful for us as we reflect on what the year has been like and maybe as we start looking forward to what is in store for 2021. Yeah, the first thing I was thinking about that you can certainly see here in Revelation, but also in this year, is that nothing is guaranteed. There's no solid ground but the Lord. And there's this passage, one of many passages about the overthrow of things that seemed perfectly stable and reliable. In Revelation 18, verse 11 to 18, we see this picture of all the merchants of earth weeping and mourning for that harlot that has now been overthrown. And it's Babylon the Great. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. So here's a long but I think interesting passage beginning in Revelation 18. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and slaves. That is human souls, in case you were missing, that they're also <laughs> slaving people, which are human souls made in the image of God. The fruit for which your soul has longed has gone from you, they say, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls, for in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all whose trade 
is on the sea, stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? The, they're not doing anything to help. They're standing back and just watching it all fall apart. They liked doing business with the great city because they were getting rich off of it. But man, everybody thought that Babylon the Great would stay standing forever and no one saw this coming. Wealth and power were hers. And well, look at look at us. I know. <laughs> <laughs> look at us. Whoever thought we'd end up where we are right now. I know that it's not like the United States of America has completely fallen apart and is gone forever. I know that there's a lot left to find some stability in maybe, but in this year that we've seen things we never imagined seeing, we've lost a lot of things. I mean, a lot of people have lost much more than I have, but I think it's a valuable time to stop and realize that there's a lot of things that maybe we think we can count on that we shouldn't be counting on, not in that most meaningful way. And a lot of us, most people, I think, are looking forward to, hey, vaccines are happening. Maybe changes are coming. What's the timeline when life will go back to normal? And maybe we don't have a sense from this that anything is unstable, but I think we should. <laughs> I think if this small little bit of a, I mean, I don't know what to call it. If this uh, small seems not right, but if this thing that we've gone through this year, all this stuff can't shake us a little bit to realize that we should be turning to more eternal things. I would hate to see the kind of shaking of the earth that we need to get us to think about eternal things and to get our confidence taken out of our comforts and our possessions and our leaders and our knowledge and all the other things we think can get us through and learn to let go of those things as our mainstay and hold on to the Lord of Lords. I think that phrase, we never saw it coming, is just <laughs> continues to pop up, continues to just be something that we all say, maybe we'll all think as we look back to this year. I mean, one year ago today, we didn't see this coming. Mm -hmm. And we thought that the future was guaranteed. We thought that everything was going to continue on as it always had. And like this passage that you're pulling out from Revelation 18, they just thought they'd be able to do business there forever until they couldn't, until mm -hmm. it was no longer possible. And in just a single hour, all the wealth has been laid to waste. Just with a blink of an eye here, all of a sudden, this year, everything changed. And in our life today, I think we've started to see even a small amount of that. And hopefully it's waking us up that Christ is the only foundation that's really going to last. And he talked about that with the wise man and the foolish man. You want to trust in anything. You want to trust in yourself. That's fine. But that's like building a house on sand. Yeah. So where did you, as you look at the world and this year, where did you kind of make a connection or draw a lesson? Yeah, I guess it's drawing out on that same point. We need endurance to get through this, to be able to make it through this year, 2020. We've needed endurance. We've had to make tough decisions. We've had to do things we never thought we'd have to do. And in order to get through this, I think we've had to have some amount of of grit and mm -hmm. endurance and just being willing to stick through it. And so Revelation 14, verse 12, it says, Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. So good. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This call for endurance is just timely all the time. It's always necessary. But the fact that he talks about those who die in the Lord, they're being <clears throat> persecuted. They're being put upon by others and tormented and put in anguish and all these things that they're having to go through. But blessed is someone who dies in the Lord. They're going to find at that point rest where when they've been working and toiling so hard and enduring so hard to the very end, their deeds are going to go before them into eternity. I've been thinking about pandemic fatigue <laughs> now that we've kind of been into the year for enough time where we just kind of get so tired of dealing with everything that's going on. And maybe we want to 
bury our head in the sand and pretend like everything is just normal again. But mm. like you, you brought out in Revelation 16, blessed is the one who stays awake, as Jesus says. And we just can't give up and ignore what's going on. We can't throw up our hands and just say, I'm done with this. I'm done caring about what's going on. I just want to go back to normal. I think whatever happens, this time is teaching us not to get too comfortable here and that we need to endure. We need to have grit. And you don't know how much grit you have. You don't know how how much endurance you have until it's really put to the test. And so this year, I think, has put us to the test in ways that maybe we've never been put to the test before. And are we enduring? Are we able to push forward to the point where we will have that rest from our labors when this life is over? Whenever our lives should end, will we have that eternal rest and our deeds going before us into eternity? That's, I don't know, just something that I'm thinking about here as I'm thinking about getting through this year and getting through all the things that have happened and having that kind of endurance that I need to have. Yeah, that's, uh, there's a passage that I think about when you talk about that. I love that you're using that word grit. That's one of my favorite words to (laughs) think about just the character that Jesus displayed and one of the main attributes that we need to have. I mean, the word perseverance or endurance is used so often when describing what we have to have, what Christians are like. And there's a, a passage in Acts, Acts 14, 22, where Paul and Barnabas are going around teaching the churches, and this is what they're saying to them. It says, they're strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And that's, in a way, the whole thing. Like, if I I was going to just boil down what I want to get across to my kids or to a, a new Christian or an old Christian or anybody like more than anything, continue in the faith. Once you have it, once you know what you need to do and who the Lord is and you get it, just continue in the faith and recognize ain't going to be easy. It's, <laughs> it's going to, it's going to get ugly. It's going to get nasty and you just, it's going to test your metal and you're going to have to hang on for dear life but continue steadfastly and know at the end of it, there's something worth waiting for, which is kind of my point, my uh, last insight here, which is that I have to remember that God cares more than I do. And the verse is a very familiar and beloved verse, the one that I chose towards the end of the book, Revelation 21, three through four. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And good riddance to those former (laughs) things. (laughs) See ya. (laughs) See ya. And sometimes this year... I think I've I've honestly been a little overwhelmed with just different emotions, whether it was getting depressed, getting angry, getting sad, getting frustrated about bad stuff, moral evils all over the place in different ways sure. and troubling afflictions, that other kind of of evil that sometimes the Bible uses that term for evil days or just bad things happening to people and then people doing bad things. And it can get overwhelming. And it can get lonely, but I think all of us, and I'm talking to myself though, most of all, we have to remember how much God cares about us and about everyone in this world. And Adrian and I talk about this sometimes, you know, when we see something and we just get frustrated or we we get to that point where you're that old saying, what is this world coming to? What is happening? Why would people do this? And, and that that kind of thing. And we just have to remind ourselves of this, that God cared so much about this broken world, he entered it to experience all of this pain and to save us from it. And like Isaiah says, by his wounds were healed. And someday, I love that passage, his hands will wipe away our tears. He won't outsource that task. (laughs) (laughs) Like a father, he'll tend to our hurts himself. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. He'll make us well. And as we live in that joyful new place forever, we'll be with him. 
there goes John again, connecting us with God in deeper ways, even through yeah. all of this language and everything that he's been talking about in these amazing visions. There is God with his own hand wiping away our tears. That's perfect. And I love that you said he doesn't outsource that because <laughs> we sometimes maybe view God as distant, but here he is coming close to really take care of the biggest concern that we have and to wipe it all away. No more crying, no more mourning, no more pain. It's all passed away. So where else did you find something to uh, connect this crazy year and the lessons we can draw from it? Yeah, and I, I went outside of Revelation for this last one, and this has been on my mind a little bit lately. But I think if this year teaches us anything, and we've danced around this topic a little bit here, but let's just put a point on it, that our weakness is on full display right now. I mean, if there's anything that you can describe what's causing all of this, a couple of droplets in the air could potentially end our life. Really? I'm like, mm. that's amazing to think about. Mm. And it reminds me of this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, where Paul says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be also manifest in our bodies. I don't know, I think up until this year, we may have all felt a little bit indestructible. Maybe not literally, I think, but as a general rule, we never thought that what would happen this year would ever happen. We never daily had thoughts, probably most of us, about dying or about getting sick. We probably never every single day woke up and said, do I have a temperature today? Am I having trouble breathing today? Am I potentially contagious to other people today? Like that wasn't a thought in 2019. But here in this last year, that, that's something that we've been thinking about. Our jars of clay, these fragile, delicate, ordinary kind of vessels that God has placed an amazing treasure within, and that is the light of the face of his son, Jesus. That's the gospel that's been put into our hearts, that's been given to us by God himself to teach us about himself, to teach us about who his son is. I mean, that that's what's inside, but our bodies are jars of clay. They're just delicate. I think this whole year has shown us how delicate we are and how, how much we shouldn't trust in this life. And no matter how much trust we have in these jars of clay, in this fragile life that we live in, life has always been a vapor. And the reason why is so that God can teach us that it's not about us. It's always about him. It's always been about him. And we need to just focus on him. We need to focus on eternal things, heavenly things. And then that helps us, I think, to get through and to balance these difficulties we experience. Like Paul said, we're afflicted, but not crushed. We're perplexed but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. We're just able to get through things when we realize that it's not about us. It's always about God. And that brings hope. That brings a confidence and a trust. And it brings strength to trust in God rather than trusting in ourselves. And I hope that's what this whole year has done for us. Don't trust in yourself. You're not capable of figuring it out. You're not capable of making it through on your own. It's all about the Lord. And that too, is what we see in Revelation. These people who are being persecuted and afflicted, it's God who enacts justice and makes everything right. It's not us, it's God. And if we can trust in him, if we can trust in the lamb, then he has the power to bring us through. Just a good reminder, I think. Yeah, yeah, it is. My favorite out of all of that list that you read is perplexed, but not driven to despair. <laughs> What is happening? <laughs> what is happening? I think it, I think it's a little reassuring to know that Paul also was perplexed at times and it's okay to be perplexed and confused and a little overwhelmed by not understanding what's happening in our lives and all around us just as long as we don't let it drive us to despair because we don't have to understand everything to know again the things that matter most to be able to find peace and hope and confidence and even joy in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I guess it just all boils down to faith because we don't need to know 
the ways that God operates. We don't need to understand all of his plans and and be able to solve the complex equation that he's working out. It's all about just trusting in him because he has the plan. Even though I might not see it, I know that he's got it all in control. I think that's a good place to end up as we kind of move into our challenge here. What's our challenge for this week? All right. So as we come to the end of the year, as we come to the end of this Into the Book Bible Reading plan, maybe you haven't gotten all the way done with your reading. I know not everybody's able to dedicate every single day to reading. Sometimes you get behind. If you can catch up by the end of the year, I would encourage you to do that. I'd encourage you, maybe if you have some time off of work in the next week or so, take some time and get caught up. Be able to say at the end of this year that no matter what happened with all of the crazy stuff that was going on, that at least you were able to read the entire New Testament this year. Being able to say that you accomplished something that you had set out to accomplish as much as the world tried to throw you off, you still accomplished what you set out to accomplish by reading through the New Testament. And if you didn't do it, it's a great time to start for next year. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning into the Bible Geeks podcast. You can find us on our website at BibleGeeks.fm. You can find show notes for this episode at BibleGeeks.fm slash 90 or in your podcast player of choice. You can also follow along with us on social media. If you'd like, we're on Facebook or on Instagram. And we're also on Twitter if you want to follow along with our updates throughout the year and get in touch with us there or on our website at BibleGeeks.fm slash contact. Until next week, everyone, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Shalom.